Welcome to Calvary, everyone. Hey, my name is Perry, and um, we're delighted to be able to continue on in worship this morning. Let me just walk through this week, because first of all, happy Palm Sunday. We have a lot going on this week, and I want to make sure that we're all on the same page in terms of what's coming up, because there are many ways that we can be involved and celebrate what's going on this week as we remember the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we are not going to take communion this morning. We normally do that the first Sunday of every month, but we will take it this Friday at 6.30 at our Good Friday services. We'll be right in this room where we will reflect on and remember the significance of Jesus's crucifixion and all that he sacrificed for us. We hope you can join us for that. And again, we will take communion in that service instead of this morning. Now, the next day on Saturday at 10 o'clock until noon is our egg hunt. This is one of the coolest events that we do all year long. It's a time where kids and families from around the community, some from Calvary, but some from outside of Calvary, some who don't even have a church home, some who have never even heard the gospel before, they will be here and they will get to hear the gospel maybe for the first time. And there are numerous ways that you can be a part of that. You can find out more information at calvarybible.com slash Easter, along with the Good Friday service, and along with our Easter services, which will be at the normal service times of 9 and 1030 next week when we just have a blast celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That'll be events that we hope that you can participate in because we want to remember everything that God has done for us through his son. We've been in this series out of the book of Luke for 26 weeks, 26 weeks. And everything is culminating in the events of these last couple chapters and this last week of Jesus's life. We want to remember well, because whenever we remember, we bring something that's in the past into the present in our minds and think about its significance for our lives today. The author C.S. Lewis wrote in Mere Christianity that we have to be continually reminded of what we believe. Neither this belief nor any other will automatically remain alive in the mind. It must be fed. This week, we are feeding our minds through the eyewitness testimony from Luke's gospel about Jesus's life, death, burial, and resurrection. Now, it's been six weeks since we looked at the triumphal entry, the events of Palm Sunday. And back then, we saw out of Luke chapter 19 that when Jesus came into Jerusalem, it says the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Those are words of Psalm 118. And they were praised as Jesus was riding in as the humble but victorious conquering king. The multitude of his disciples points to the success of Jesus's ministry. This wasn't just the 12 disciples, but it was a gathering of many other disciples who were following Jesus and who were headed to Jerusalem all for the same purpose. And that purpose was to celebrate the Passover. They were there to remember. So these events that we remember this week about Easter also took place in a setting where they were remembering. But there's a subtle warning in it all. Because as they were preparing to celebrate and to remember God's saving work in the past, they were also plotting to oppose God's saving work in the present. May that not be true of us today. So before we get started this morning into the passage that we will be looking at in Luke chapter 22 and 23. Let's just take a moment and ask the Lord to give us hearts and minds that are open to the work that he's doing right now. So Father, we we do lift up this time to you this morning. We ask God that you would give us hearts that are receptive, that are responsive to your saving work right now in our lives. Lord, we don't want to miss out on what you're doing right now, even as we look back and remember the things that you did long ago. Lord, we thank you for the fact that you are still at work in our lives, and I pray, God, for the grace of being able to see it, and Lord, that we would be in alignment with your work rather than in opposition to it. So we pray all of this this morning, asking you to bless our time. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, well, we are at a very different moment this morning than the triumphal entry. 
Just a few days have passed since Jesus came into Jerusalem to much celebration. But now we're looking at the moment that happens after Jesus has been arrested. It said in Luke 22, verse 53, that Jesus said this to the people who were coming to get him, that when I was with you day after day in the temple, and you did not lay your hands on me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. What we're reading about in these events that are unfolding now this morning is about the power of darkness at work. This is what it looked like in Jesus's ministry when the power of darkness was a part. Okay, so we're going to pick up in verse 63 now of chapter 22. It says this, Now the men who were holding Jesus in custody were mocking him as they beat him. They also blindfolded him and kept asking him, Prophesy, who is it that struck you? And they said many other things against him, blaspheming him. Every child on a playground knows what mockery is. It's teasing. It's making fun of. And especially when somebody has a reputation or has made a claim of greatness and no one believes it to be true. That's what mockery is. And in this case, the opponents of Jesus even have a prop with a blindfold. They're blindfolding him and trying to mock him through it by saying, hey, who hit you? Who hit you? If you remember back in Luke 6, which was long ago in our series, but in Luke 6, Jesus was teaching in a synagogue on the Sabbath. And a man with a disfigured hand walked in. And it says the religious leaders there were watching carefully to see if Jesus would heal on the Sabbath. But they hadn't said a word. And Luke tells us that Jesus knew their thoughts. Surely the one who knows the unspoken thoughts of others is not in any way hindered by a blindfold from knowing the actions of others. So they're mocking him and ridiculing him. And in all of this, we see that the real central question of what is going on as they mock is that they do not believe Jesus to be who he says he is. That is the central question of Luke. Who is Jesus? It's the central question for us this morning. Who is Jesus? It's the question of his identity. It's the one that we cannot face or we cannot escape facing. In Luke chapter 9, Jesus had asked his disciples explicitly, who do the crowds say that I am? Some said Elijah or John the Baptist, but then he turned it back on them and said, who do you say that I am? That's our question this morning. Because what we decide about Jesus makes all the difference in the world for us. As we keep reading, we see that the charge against Jesus is blasphemy on their part, that he is pretending to be God when he's really not. But the charge that, that Luke says that they are actually guilty of as they mock him is the same. It's blasphemy. They are truly being blasphemous as they mock the Son of God. Okay, let's keep going. It says this, that when day came, the assembly of the elders of the people gathered together, both chief priests and scribes, and they led him away to their council. And they said, if you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, if I tell you, you will not believe. And if I ask you, you will not answer. The council is the Sanhedrin. This is the highest legal authority in Israel. Whatever this council of people decides, it's the law. As long as it's okay with Rome. They have to get Rome's approval in everything they decide, because if they don't, then they, whatever they decide cannot happen. Rome is actually the higher authority in this case. But this question, if we just repel down into the text right now, we would say, well, this seems like an honest enough question. If you're the Christ, tell us. If you're the Messiah, if you're the anointed one, if you're the one we've been hoping for who will rescue us and set us free, just tell us. But we've been at this now for 26 weeks. We know the truth. Jesus knows as well that this isn't actually a quest for truth. This is a quest to condemn. It's a quest to convict Jesus. He says, if, if I tell you, you're not going to believe me. And if I ask you a question, you won't even answer it. This isn't a quest for truth. There's an author who writes about this kind of self-deception that we can get into. And he says this, when we are self-deceived, whenever we manage our own beliefs for the sake of some goal, 
other than the truth. That's right where Jesus' opponents are here. Their goal, other than the truth, well, they stated it explicitly soon after the triumphal entry. Jesus went into the temple and he cleansed it of people who were misusing the temple for commercial gain. And right after that, it says that the religious leaders, their goal was to destroy Jesus. They don't care about the truth. They just want to achieve their goal of destroying him. This is the problem that we face whenever we oppose Jesus, whenever we doubt his identity. But Jesus takes this already intense moment and he actually turns up the heat on it if we keep reading. Here's what he says. But from now on, the Son of Man shall be seated at the right hand of the power of God. So they all said, are you the Son of God then? And he said to them, you say that I am. Then they said, what further testimony do we need? We have heard it ourselves from his own lips. This is a curious question because what Jesus has done here is he has just taken an already intense situation about his identity and he's actually turned it into more than just about his identity, but also about his authority. It's about the idea that Jesus will one day be at the right hand of the power of God when he's talking to them. And they know that only God could be in this kind of a position. Only somebody who is divine can possibly be in that proximity to God. So Jesus makes the claim that I will be in that place. And they understand and they track with him as they say, are you the son of God? Jesus does not flatly accept it or deny it, though. Because when they ask him the question, he replies in this kind of ambiguous way, you say that I am. Some actually take this as a question. Do you say that I am? But what Jesus is doing here is he knows, he knows that their concept of the Son of God is not accurate. So if he answers yes, it's just a quick condemnation, but they don't understand exactly what even is meant by that. But of course, he can't deny it either, because to deny it would be to deny what is true. But even though Jesus does not confirm it, The fact that he does not strongly deny it is all the evidence they need in their own minds to convict him. And what we see here as we look at this question of who is Jesus, we can think about the high points like the triumphal entry on Palm Sunday. We can think about some of the other high points in Jesus's ministry. But the overall tone and the overall just series of events with Jesus shows us that Jesus was rejected by this world. Jesus was rejected by this world. And it's a rejection of his identity. It's a rejection of his authority. But the Sanhedrin has a problem now. Because as I said earlier, they don't have the ultimate authority in order to decide Jesus' fate. That belongs to Rome. Rome doesn't care, though, about their internal religious squabbles. And so they need to take this situation and convert it into something that Rome would care about. So it's time for them to take a religious issue and make it political. Okay, let's keep going now into chapter 23. It says, then the whole company of them arose and brought him before Pilate. This is Friday morning. And they began to accuse him saying, we found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. So interesting that Jesus isn't even given a name here. He's just a man. He's this anonymous fellow, this poor carpenter from a a town that's insignificant out in the sticks of Israel, far away from Jerusalem. But yet somehow, He is misleading the entire nation. The next charge that he's calling them to, you can go back to that. Um, He's calling them to not pay taxes to Caesar, to not give tribute to Caesar, comes straight out of Luke 20. We looked at it just a few weeks ago, where some people came up to try to trick Jesus. And they asked him, is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? And he said, bring me a denarius, bring me a coin. And whose likeness and whose inscription is on this coin? And they replied, it's Caesar's. And then Jesus says in a brilliant way, well, then give to Caesar's the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. In other words, 
it's Caesar's coin when he's asking for it, give it back to him, pay your taxes. But as you do that, remember the ultimate authority is God. The Caesar himself is under authority, whether he recognizes it or not. So what we have here is just a blatant lie. Jesus did not forbid paying tribute to Caesar at all. But it's this third one where he's saying that he himself is Christ, a king. That's the one that gets Pilate's attention. So in verse 3, Pilate asks Jesus, he says, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him in a way that might sound familiar. You have said so. Again, we could take this as a question. Do you say so? But either way, what Jesus is doing here is neither confirming nor denying again, because he knows that the concept of a king that Pilate has in his mind is one of an earthly king. Is Jesus that type of king? No. But is Jesus a king? Absolutely, he is a king. But one of an entirely different variety, an entirely different category. It's kind of like the question that sometimes people can be tricked with by saying, have you stopped embezzling funds from your employer? Well, yeah, no, wait, what are you asking me? It's a question like that that doesn't have a simple yes or no answer. And that's why Jesus doesn't answer it the way that they want him to, to incriminate himself. As we keep going now in verse four, Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. Now remember, in the conversation that had just happened with the religious leaders, when Jesus got to this point, they lost their minds and they accuse him and take him before Pilate. Here though, Pilate says, I find no guilt in him. But they were urgent saying, he stirs up the people teaching throughout all Judea from Galilee, even to this place. So Pilate finds Jesus to be innocent. And the question that we should want to know then is why doesn't Pilate release Jesus then if he's innocent? But it's the, the yelling and the volume of the opponents here who keep accusing Jesus in light of all of this. And Pilate right at this point has his moment where he could act. But instead of acting with courage, he acts with cowardice, and he keeps Jesus in custody. See, this is not only just a mockery of Jesus' Jesus's identity, but we see that it's also a mockery of truth. It's a mockery of truth as these religious leaders misrepresent who Jesus really is. It's a mockery then of courage on Pilate's part as he refuses to release Jesus, even though he just declared him innocent. But for Pilate, there's a word there's a word that stuck out in all of the yelling and all of the shouting that took place here, and it's the word Galilee. Jesus is from Galilee? Maybe that can be somebody else's problem. Okay, let's keep going. Because when Pilate heard this, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. And when he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him over to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at that time. So Israel at this time is divided into several different regions, several different areas. It has different local governors. Pilate is over the area in and around Jerusalem. Meanwhile, Galilee is an area up north outside of Jerusalem, and that's Herod's jurisdiction, another governor's jurisdiction. So Pilate, when he hears that Jesus had ministered in Galilee, can see, ah, maybe I can pass the buck over to Herod. And that's exactly what he does here. So then when Herod sees him, he's very glad for he had long desired to see him because he had heard about him and he was hoping to see some sign done by him. So he questioned him at some length, but he made no answer. The chief priests and the scribes stood by though, vehemently accusing Jesus. Herod was interested in Jesus like an audience is interested in a performer. He wants to see a show. He wants to be amused by Jesus. He's not interested in following Jesus or in taking Jesus seriously, but he would love for Jesus to amuse him somehow. He's heard about Jesus. Jesus and Herod had a complicated history, even though they never met in person. Herod was the one who had arrested John and had him beheaded. Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist. Herod was perplexed by Jesus 
Herod was interested in Jesus. And the Pharisees at one point told Jesus that he needed to leave the region because Herod wanted to kill him. But Herod finally has his moment of seeing Jesus. But Jesus will not give him the dignity and the honor of a show. In fact, Jesus is silent before him. Commentators point out how Jesus never turns down a sincere question. So that should tell us something about Herod's motivation with the fact that Jesus is completely silent before him. Herod doesn't know who Jesus is, but Jesus knows who Jesus is. If you read Isaiah 53, which I recommend, it's a beautiful picture of who Jesus is, written many years before Jesus was born in Bethlehem. But you read there in verse 7 that Jesus was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. Jesus will not give Herod the dignity of entertaining him. So if Jesus will not entertain Herod on his own, Jesus will or Herod, rather, will find a way to make Jesus more entertaining. Let's get back to the text. It says this in verse 11, And Herod with his soldiers treated him with contempt and mocked him. Then arraying him in splendid clothing, he sent him back to Pilate. There's a Swiss legend written, written back in the 1800s by a man named Gustav Schwab. It's called The Horseman in the Lake of Constance. It's written in poetic form, and Lake Constance is the third largest freshwater lake in Europe. It's right on the border, the intersection between Switzerland, Austria, and Germany. And in this legend, there's a horseman who's riding down to the side of the lake in order to get to the ferry that will take him across to the other side of the shore. He's doing this in the middle of winter, so the days are short. But he begins his journey in the daylight. And it says that it's at the time when the sunbeam glistens on fields of snow. But as he makes his way down, the shadows grow long, the sky grows dark, and pretty soon he finds himself riding across an open plain through the snow in the dark. It's quiet. The air is still. But off in the distance, he can see the glimmering flickers of light from a village, and as he gets to that village, he stops a woman and asks her, Where, which way is it to the ferry in the lake? And this is her reply to him. Both ferry and lake behind thee lie. Great God, thou hast ridden across the lake. The hoofs of thy steed have knocked at the grave. The townspeople all come out to marvel at the realization that this man has just ridden on horseback across a barely frozen lake. He's awestruck. He's horrified at the sight and the thought that just moments earlier, his life was in such great danger. The writer said, his heart stood still and on end his hair, the horrors behind him still grimly stare. He just falls to the ground, realizing how much danger he was just in without even realizing it. Herod, Pilate, the mocking religious leaders have no idea of the danger they are in. It would be a massive understatement just to say that they are treading on thin ice. This is the one for whom the Apostle Paul in Colossians says, he is the image of the invisible God. He's the firstborn, the highest of all creation. In him, all creation was made, all things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones, powers, rulers, or authorities. All things hold together in this one who they are mocking. They were blinded by the darkness of their own hearts, like the horseman was blinded by the darkness of night. They have no idea what they are doing. Who is Jesus? It's the most important question we might ask. And as we ask the question about who Jesus is, we're also making a statement about what we think of his authority over our lives. 
If we disregard or just dismiss that question, we do it in great danger. However we decide that question is either the place of greatest security or the place of greatest danger. So Herod and Pilate that day become friends. They become friends because of this connection through Jesus. But Herod doesn't do his friend any favors here because he sends him back to Pilate. Let's pick up back in the text. It says, Pilate then called together the chief priests and the rulers and the people and said to them, you brought me this man as one who was misleading the people. And after examining him before you, behold, I did not find this man guilty of any of your charges against him. Neither did Herod, for he sent him back to us. Look, nothing deserving death has been done by him. I will therefore punish and release him. This is the second time now that Pilate has declared Jesus innocent. Why is Jesus still in custody then? It's the second time he's done this. And not only that, but now Herod. Herod has added his own verdict onto the equation by sending Jesus back, which he would have never done if Jesus was truly guilty in his eyes. Jesus was rejected by this world through the injustice of this world. We see this great injustice unfolding in scene after scene and verse after verse as Jesus has no charge against him that can actually stick, but yet he's still in custody. Why? Okay, we keep reading now, and we see that, but they all cried out together now. This is the people, the people along with the leaders. They have now gathered the scene, gathered into the scene, and they're now a part of it. So it's no longer a private meeting, but this is a public conference. It says, but they all cried out together, away with this man, and release to us Barabbas, a man who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection, started in the city, and for murder. Pilate addressed them once more, desiring to release Jesus, but they kept shouting, crucify, crucify him. A third time, he said to them, why, what evil has he done? I've found in him no guilt deserving death. I will therefore punish and release him. They keep urging for Jesus to be crucified for no reason. They don't have any case against him, but yet they're still demanding his life for Barabbas. Barabbas is a name, and probably a nickname, that means son of the father. He's juxtaposed with Jesus now here in this, so that we can see these two who can be known as the son of the father. And we can compare and contrast the different roles and the different treatment that they have. Barabbas, he is the real deal. Barabbas is a true insurrectionist. Barabbas has been in participating in true crime. This is a man who opposed Rome enough to try to overthrow it and in the process of doing so committed murder. In one sense, Barabbas is more of a Messiah to these people than Jesus is. And Barabbas is the one who has demonstrated the courage to overtake Rome, to stand up to Rome, and he's in prison for it. Meanwhile, Jesus seems to be completely uninterested in actually overthrowing Rome, even though they've tried to make charges against him for that very thing. You see the deceit. You see the lack of courage. You see the complete confusion over Jesus's true identity. Jesus, he was rejected by the world through the injustice of this world. Okay, but there's more. After this, we read, but they were urgent, demanding with loud cries that he should be crucified, and their voices prevailed. So Pilate decided that their demand should be granted he released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, for whom they asked, but he delivered Jesus over to their will. What we see right here is this exchange of the truly innocent for the truly guilty. That's what we read here, and we just can't help wonder, how could they possibly be in a place of requesting Jesus to be the one who would be crucified. Meanwhile, the true criminal, the one who's truly guilty, would be asked to be set free. 
Perhaps it's because Pilate and Herod had declared Jesus innocent and they hated Rome so badly that if Rome declared somebody innocent in their own minds, that automatically meant him guilt, meant he was guilty. But throughout this passage, what we see over and over is this idea of Jesus facing the rejection of the world through the injustice of the world. But right here in this exchange with Barabbas, we see that it was to take our place in this world. We are in the position of being truly guilty ourselves. But yet Jesus has taken our place. There's an exchange being made here the truly guilty for the truly innocent. And it all hinges on that question that we began with. Who is Jesus? How you answer that question determines whether Jesus takes your place. It's remarkable that Jesus is the one who's on trial here. That throughout the trial, people are asking him questions, but really the questions are turned back on everyone asking him. It's not really Jesus who's on trial, but it's the religious leaders. It's the Roman leaders who are the ones on trial. Who do they say Jesus is? And as we read this morning, the same question is posed to us. Who is Jesus? We talked about the importance of remembering the start. What are we remembering out of this passage? We're remembering that Jesus faced the rejection of this world so we can experience the acceptance of God. Jesus experienced rejection from our world so that we can experience the acceptance of God. That's what we're remembering. That's what we should have in our minds as we approach this whole week. As we approach the week of thinking all of these events that Jesus participated in and that we're remembering now, the things that we are grateful for, it all begins with this point that Jesus exchanged himself in our place. And through that, we are released like Barabbas. Who is Jesus? It's a question each one of us has to answer. But as we go through this week, whether you answered that question decades ago because you've been a follower of Jesus for a long time, or whether you're still in a place where you're not sure, my hope is that you will recognize that question being central to your life. My hope is that as we go through this week, that this will keep being that question that will echo in our minds, who is Jesus? We'll be reminded of the fact that this is the one who faced the rejection from the world so that we can be accepted. Okay, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word that reminds us of this truth. Thank you, God, for the, the promises that you have laid out to us through the actions and the words of your son, the promise of our own forgiveness and the promise of our own acceptance by God, completely undeserved though we are. Father, I pray for those of us who might still be questioning who you are and just ask, Lord, that this would be clarifying to them and that as we go through this week, celebrating your crucifixion, celebrating your resurrection. Lord, that we would be convinced in our own minds and in our own hearts of who you truly are as the Son of God. Father, I pray that you would reassure and reaffirm our faith, God, so that we would be the people you have made us to be. We ask all of this in your holy and awesome, precious name, the name of Jesus. Amen.